Patrick, you were you were in a deep dark hole. What's going on, man? What are you doing starting the show? What are you, what are you I, do you Huh? I, it's the last day of the year. I'm changing things up. What? I'm off my game. I didn't I don't even know what to do. I I'm gonna stop broadcast. Stop broadcast. I saw, that, I saw the live button before you did. I that's that's not my fault. You I was about to open my mouth. Wow. Wow. You're really trying to change things up on this last day. This last bomb in the AM of the year. It's the last day of school. We're fucking anarchy. Who gives a shit? Uh, that's kind of like the like the weird rules that uh, kids would tell themselves. We used to have this one. If a if the teacher was out, I guess this would be this had to have been high school because you could leave school. Mm. Uh, if the teacher was out and there was a substitute, and the substitute wasn't there in the first ten minutes, the urban myth was that you were allowed to just leave class, which clearly not no, true. No. But several kids did. Yeah. I, I, I had that tested a couple of times in, I think, junior high and high school. And uh, both times, as soon as kids started to walk out, someone in the staff looked around and said, what, what are you doing out of the fucking classroom? Get back into the fucking classroom. What are you doing? Yeah. So that didn't work out so well for them. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any lights in this room right now. All I've got is this, this window. There's technically a closet light on, but I, I have mm. since, I since moved. This is the third spot. I have put this computer in this apartment. Uh, the first spot it was in was against a wall that was kind of tilted. Like mm -hmm. you can't, the wall doesn't look tilted, but then you look at the furniture, and it's very clearly tilted. Uh, and that can be fixed with like a, you know a little furniture pad thing so that it, it is angled right. But that didn't fix my chair like constantly like moving from left to right all the time. Mm -hmm. So then I moved to a different spot in the apartment which is near the water heater, and the water heater, while not really audible to the audience, and when I've listened to recordings, like you can hear it very faintly, uh, it is super annoying to me, because it is crazy loud uh, on my end. Um, so I decided to, to move to a different direction, which was in our guest room, which has no lights in it, uh, and I need to get lights, so I'm, I'm in this little cavern. Right now, icicle is... lights, man. Decorate with icicle lights. Just get create a nice kind of festive mood in there. Yeah, it's, and I just keep the door locked, and just when my wife comes to check on me, just sharpening a blade. <laughs> That's what's going on in here. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what's been going on in here. I've been locked in this room for too long. Oh God damn it, Patrick! It is the end of the year. This it is, is man. We've been, we've been doing this show for like six months. We have, and I think it's been a pretty good run so far. June, July, August, September, October, November. Seven months. Yeah. That's a long time. It has, and uh, I'd say thus far it has been a pleasure so far to do it. I'm sure yeah, no, at some point we'll hit a turning point, but you know, right now it's yeah, been good. Some, at, some point, at some point this will be complete dog shit, but right now it's just dog shit, and uh, yeah, it has been, it's been a lot of fun to do. Um, I guess today, like, you know, you and I were talking, there's... Not a whole, a whole lot of news that happened this week. Uh, you have I have been fairly busy uh, trying to get ahead of the game so that we can uh, enjoy uh, a time off next week. Yeah, so yeah. if people have questions, just start throwing them in the chat, and we'll kind of sprinkle them in throughout uh, as we as we go through at least a couple things that we got going on. But did you did you find any time to play anything this week? I did. I found time to play one thing, uh, and that was the uh, AC4 Freedom Cry DLC. Um, I it was I was basically between that and Walking Dead, and I knew I wanted to play Walking Dead episode one in like one shot, so I needed to find like a two hour block ish where I could actually sit down and play that, and I haven't done that yet. So Freedom Cry was something I played in like twenty minute, thirty minute spurts throughout the week, um, in the evenings. So I played through the entirety of that and finished it yesterday. Um. I'm I there is a uh, it's going to be an article that I'm highlighting and uh, worth reading this week and I'm actually going to talk to the author if not today maybe maybe early in the new year um, but Kotaku uh, had an excellent essay by the, the also excellent writer Evan Narcisse uh, who uh, has a Haitian background uh, right in his family and has written several times very personally about um, games that decide to touch on slavery. Um, and how that affects him personally. Like he just he writes so well about it, um, and and it uses the subject in in a really touching fashion. And uh, so I'm going to be chatting with him at least sometime sometime soon about sort of his personal feelings on that DLC. But I'm curious, you know, like what, what do you what do you think of it? Because it's super weird that 
that subject matter was it like watching the trailers was weirding me out because yeah. it's like, hey, we're gonna touch on this really sensitive subject as this character is shoving this sword in like thirty dudes' eyes, and like really meaningful, touching dialogue plays over all of this eye stabbing that's occurring. Yeah, so I, I couldn't quite tell what tone they were going for. There is a strangeness of tone to that DLC. Um, it, it is definitely trying to tackle a subject like that as thoughtfully as it can within the context of a game where the entire premise is you run around stabbing dudes in increasingly stylish ways. So in that respect... It almost comes off a little exploitation-y uh, in like a sort of almost like Django Unchained kind of way, but without like the nod and the wink and the, you know, sort of like, look how crazy this is kind of thing. It's just, here is this hyper-violence juxtap- or, you know, basically uh, framed up against, you know, these really horrible images of dudes being sold into slavery and these being whipped and all this other really fucked up shit that, you know, is is not something you see depicted in games with such excruciating detail as this DLC often kind of tends to delve into. I think the story it tells is pretty good. I think it fleshes out a little bit of Adewale's character in a good way. And I think that some of the characters it surrounds him with, I wish there was a little more with them, but they're good. They're interesting, you know, players in all of this. I think that it doesn't have enough room to really explore the subject matter in a meaningful way. I think that it, it, it definitely nails some of the it nails a lot of the details, but it doesn't really get to, to, to build them out into something much more engaging than, you know, a, a few hours worth of DLC. And I, I think a, that's a little disappointing. Yeah, but I think if that's your reaction, yeah, I think that's really encouraging because it doesn't it seem is. like it comes across as exploitative of something that could easily have been, hey, here's we'll use this sensitive subject because it'll attract attention. You know, it's, it's attention-grabbing. Um, it fits within the world, but they, it just seems like they maybe you know if the if the biggest complaint is man, I wish they had gone further and done a little bit more with it. That seems yeah. like that's a good first step for a game of this caliber, at least in terms of production and how usually not nuanced uh, games of this type usually are uh, in regards to handling uh, really sensitive issues. That seems that seems like they did they did a good job. Here are the two major problems I have with it. One, it's buggy as shit. Um, they clearly did not have a lot of time to finish that DLC, so there are a lot of little things where, like, you know, you'll 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 finish, you know, capturing a slave ship, and then uh, for some reason it won't finish. It, like, it just won't complete the mission. Uh, or, you know, you'll see like guys on your ship instead of climbing the masts or whatever, they'll just be standing there, totally, you know, statuesque, like, just broken animation type stuff. Like, a lot of, like, a lot of little things like that that sometimes, like, really get in the way of you enjoying what you're doing. Um, the other problem is, and this is, I don't know, maybe this is just a philosophical thing for me, but there's a, the way it treats the, the ancillary slave characters in the game, like the people you're rescuing throughout, uh, is a little weird in the sense that throughout the game, you're trying to rescue as many slaves as you can, and a lot of them will join the Maroons, which is this faction of, you know, uh, freed slaves that are, you know, want to rise up against, you know, sort of the the, the authoritarian, you know, regime, the, the French that, that, that are, uh, you know, currently occupying what, what eventually becomes Haiti. Uh, the problem is it doesn't really do anything with them other than treat them as kind of, a commodity, honestly. Like, you know, you're constantly trying to build up numbers of, of slaves that you have rescued, and that is how you unlock stuff. Okay, and so 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 it kind of becomes a, a collectible, and in some yeah. way that, that has a sort of unfortunate irony given the context of what this DLC's uh, sort of premise is about. Yeah, it's, pr it, it's weird that way, and the other thing is that, like, you know, you'll rescue those slaves, and you know, you'll kill those jailers, or you'll 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 take down this plantation somewhere in the Caribbean. But then that just starts all over again. Like there is no end game to that stuff. Like every time you 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 know clear out a plantation, eventually a new owner will just move in, and you will have to go do that again, or you can go do that again. Mm. Uh, or, or as you're walking around Port-au-Prince. Like, you know, the same, you know, collective, like, there'll be a group of, of jailed slaves, like, being walked through the streets. 
the same, you know, slave auction area will just cut, keep getting repopulated. So it's like it never ends. And that's, I don't know, it just, it came off a little weird to me, honestly. I just, I think that that was a system that was maybe not as well thought through as some of the other aspects of that DLC. Interesting. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm definitely curious to play it. I'm I'm in the, I guess, home stretch of uh, Assassin's Creed 4. That's the game I've been kind of plucking away at um, this past couple weeks. I took Monday afternoon off when this cold was at its worst um, and kind of just blasted through a bunch of the, the story stuff there. So I think I'm on, like, sequence 10, and I think okay. there's is 13, so I'm in sort of the, the home stretch of the story, but uh, that has come at, you know, I've been ignoring a lot of the side stuff, and I do want, I want to do a lot more of that, but I kind of, you know, eventually it's like, oh, Jesus, I've spent like 15, 18 hours in here, like I need to, you know, I start to get anxious after spending that much time with one game, um, and at least want to get through the story stuff, um, and then, you know, I'll, uh, you know, next week I'll, I'll probably flesh out some of the, the side stuff, but even the side stuff, you know, starts to become a little repetitive, um, over time. Uh, it does. Capturing a, a ship is not nearly as interesting when the novelty wears off and then you're only doing it to farm materials. And uh, the, it's just like the uh, the bigger ships that would make it easier, I'm just, you know, so underpowered uh, in terms of being able to, to take on that, you know, it, it right now I'm just grinding to get better hull uh, so that I can actually survive a battle with like a, you know, a legendary ship or or something like that. Um, yeah. And I started dipping around in... I was really excited about like the underwater swimming sections, and those are could not be more disappointing. There's there's a, not, they're my least favorite part of the whole side ventures. There's just nothing to them. Like All you're doing is going down there to find Abstergo uh, little gems, which I'm not even sure why I'm collecting those. It's like, what to yeah. what end am I doing those for? And then... There's just treasure down there, and the treasure isn't that much money. It's really not worth collecting in order to buy stuff. Like you may as well be doing the uh, the fleet uh, stuff that that gets you more money in a quicker fashion. And it's just too bad because it's gorgeous down there, and the idea of like swing around in this these big coral environments is super neat. Uh, except that like once you've done it twice, there's just not a whole lot of like avoiding the sharks isn't fun. Like it's not. No. It's it's like the worst kind of stealth in that game, where oftentimes. The game is asking you to go into these big open areas to collect things, and there's nowhere to hide from these damn sharks. And so then you die, but there's really no consequence of dying, so who cares? Just go ahead and die and then make it to the, to the area you were in before. Uh, so that was disappointing. And then I just feel bad fighting when I'm doing the harpooning. Yeah. I, like, it's not... I did like, it once, and I was like, okay, that's, that's enough for me. Yeah, like, it, it tries... I think it, it tries to contextualize it in this way where... All of a sudden, out of nowhere, you're in this little, uh, this, I don't know, like a little dinghy kind of ship, and it's it's stormy and it's dark, and ooh, this ooh, this creature's trying to kill you, and like that's why you've got to kill it. When it's like, no, like that doesn't make any. This isn't all Moby Dick. Like that you're trying to make it like Moby Dick, so I don't feel bad that I'm harpooning this whale. Uh, but I don't really need to craft that stuff, so I'm probably not going to harpoon any more blue whales. Uh, so the, the, the one trick about the crafting in that game is that, you know, it's cool that that stuff is tied to the hunting, like it actually gives the hunting a purpose and it gives you something to do with that stuff as opposed to just, I don't know, killing stuff to sell it, you know, whatever. Um, but you can get through that game pretty much without crafting anything. I, I mm. crafted a few things and, you know, I would sometimes go back to see if I really needed it, but honestly, I was able to get through pretty much all the major missions without having severely upgraded anything. Uh, you know, I, I think I got, like, an extra holster and an extra dart pouch, and that was pretty much it. Okay, some people in the chat are saying a lot of the uh, ship upgrades are part of shipwrecks um, right. that, are, that are underwater, which which makes sense. And if, if you want to fully upgrade your ship and go for uh, after the legendary ships, like, there are a, a set of ships that are just crazy powerful. So yeah. I imagine if you want all of that stuff, that you would need to uh, to investigate all that stuff. So not saying there isn't some worthwhile material down there, but if I'm not going to for completionist status on the game, right. you know, it's sort of I, I kind of ran out of steam uh, pretty quickly. Um, at least opposed to you know, I still get a real rush out of finding all of the points to synchronize. That is still right. probably my favorite thing to do in an Assassin's Creed game, and I will probably for sure uh, do do all of those in this game as well. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I I still feel bad about killing that turtle. 
I understand. You know, it's I, I felt bad when I when I randomly jumped on an ocelot and killed it. Like I didn't really want to do that, you know, but I did a few times. Uh, it's, it's weird. It's it's weird how you feel differently when the game is giving. Like the reason I felt bad about the turtle was not because I killed the turtle. It was because I killed the turtle and I couldn't, you couldn't do it. anything with it. Right. Like I think you know in games, especially when you have sort of hunting stuff, even if you have sort of a you know personal uh, aversion to the idea of of hunting animals. Uh, is that well? It's for a purpose, and it's in a game. I get it, mm-hmm. um, but like, it's, it still makes me feel uncomfortable. Whatever I'm like, you know, from crafting, if it's for food, like it's okay. I get it. Like it's it's justified and contextualized in the world in a way that uh, I can I can I can jive with. Uh, with the turtle, it's like I literally just shot that fucking turtle in the face. <laughs> yeah, and that was it. And then I went into like, oh, let's go skin it mode, and it was like, can't skin it. I was like, oh, can't do anything. It's just a turtle. You just killed a fucking turtle for no reason. I did. I did. Uh, that's the one thing about the Freedom Cry DLC. Like, even with the, with the the sort of weird, you know, context stuff, you know, the story in in Freedom Cry I think is pretty damn good. And in some respects, it it nails a few points I think better about the Ottawale character than the main story ever really did about the Kenway character. Mm. Um, that said, uh, the side stuff that is in there feels totally superfluous. Like, there's really no reason for you to be going around hunting for chests uh, or, you know, di- doing any <laughs> diving for shipwrecks or any of that stuff because the piracy aspect of that character, because it takes place, like I think, like 15 years after the events of the main game, mm. is such a minor point in all of that. So, you know, they, they've basically pushed that stuff pretty far to the side. There really aren't any side missions in Port-au-Prince. It's just, like, some stuff around the Caribbean you can go hunting for... Mostly you're just looking for slave ships that you can take down and then rescue, like, huge chunks of, of you know, like, large groups of slaves that are on board the ship. Uh, and that's actually the one ni- interesting wrinkle is that you have to not damage the slave ship because you will kill the people you're trying to rescue if you do that. You just have to kill all their escorts and then board the ship. And then a lot of times the, the escort ships will make that very difficult for you by getting in front of the ship, and then when you're blasting cannons, you accidentally end up shooting the slave ship, which is not what you want to do. <laughs> so that was, like, the one nice, you know interesting wrinkle to that stuff. But for the most part, it's like, here's a couple of shipwrecks. Here are some scattered... Like, literally, you go to an abandoned fort, and there are, like, th- oh, there's three chests on this island. Oh, two of them are right at the front of the fort, and the other one is at the beach, like, five feet away. Great. Mm-hmm. Like, it's they really didn't put a lot of thought into that stuff at all. But the story, because the story is, you know, I think pretty worthwhile, and they did put a lot of effort, I think, into to making that into something pretty interesting, I can kind of forgive that. Sure. Uh, it, but I, I the, really, in the main game, I did like going and doing a lot of that side stuff, with the exception of the shipwrecks. Uh, I kind of enjoyed doing all those different little side ventures. I, this is different in that it is very story-focused, so I think I, I was okay with it just being that. Hmm. Yeah, I wish we could talk about The Walking Dead. Unfortunately, I I played that on PS3. I was right. secretly hoping they would just do a PS4 version, which my suspicion is that there will be a PS4 version midway through the season. That's kind of how I, how I feel that's probably going to go. Um, and hopefully they're, you know, maybe some of the hang-up there is figuring out the save porting, because the idea that they're going to make you start over uh, mm-hmm. would be crazy. Um, but uh, I haven't played it yet because there's no season pass on the, the Sony stuff yet. So right. if I was to purchase the first episode, I might as well just purchase all the other episodes individually, because right. the discount only makes sense if you buy the season pass up front uh, all right. at once. Uh, so for whatever reason, that's not in the store yet. Uh, maybe that's changed since I checked two days ago. Um, but yeah, it has been bumming me out that I have not been playing that because that is you know, easily one of my most anticipated things this year um, is to see what they, they do with that. And uh, yeah, some of the reaction you know, has been encouraging and I, I want to see it I want to see it for myself. Uh, but you know, I imagine the telltale will get that sorted out between now and uh, when we when we rejoice. Rejoin and rejoice again in 2014, um, and can finally talk about it. But unfortunately, I've not had a chance to play it yet. Yeah, I've blocked off uh, two solid hours on Sunday uh, while my girlfriend is off volunteering at an animal shelter to make that my Walking Dead time. You know, normally that's something I do in the evening, like after work or whatever. But because I have been trying to shepherd through something like 20 odd different uh, top t- guest top 10 lists and still trying to make my own, which I I have not. I have a list of games that has not been ordered in any way or chopped down in any way. It's about 25 games at this point. So I See, I'm ahead of the game. Like, I'm, I haven't written out 
my explanations, my justifications for my top ten, but I got my top ten. It's too late now. Yeah. So you got you are, that settled. You are you are you are in a more difficult position, and that is that's too bad. That's too well, bad. That's gonna make yeah. your Friday kind of shitty. No, it's okay because I've only got one other one guest list to edit so far today. That means okay. I can kind of take the time to work on that today. So I don't think I'm totally fucked yet. Why you gotta Why you gotta be so mocking about it? Like, come on, man, we're a team. Why you gotta Why you gotta start this? Why you gotta start shit? Because that's just that's just what that's just how it goes. I guess people it's are saying day. that people are saying you can you can I forgot you can buy not to keep focusing on hunting animals in Assassin's Creed, but you can mm -hmm. buy you can buy the hunting material at shops. So oh, well, there you go. You don't want to shoot those animals. You don't have to. I really don't want to shoot any animals ever. Um, yeah. So you play anything else? Is that about it? That was pretty much it. Uh, I did play a little bit more of Zelda, which I still really, really like. Yeah, uh, big surprise game. there, you know. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much been it. I, I've I've wanted to spend more time playing Dead Rising Three, but I think I finally got enough of that game to where I'm like, that's probably not going to make my top ten, but that is a really good game. I'm pleased with the direction that sequel is, it has taken things. So, you know, I, I at least can say that about it. Sure. What All else right, have you been see. playing? Anything? No, no, just Assassin's Creed. I haven't had time okay. for anything else. All right. Um, we need to get back on Risk of Rain at some point. I'm I'm yep. free all next week if you want to play some Risk of Rain. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. Even though we will be uh, off work, uh, we, we might have to... Uh, like Risk of Rain is just something I want to do, so we might have to find a way to... To make that happen, uh, let's see. There's some uh, some little bit of news. Not too much mm -hmm. happened this week. There was a big Nintendo Direct. Well, I guess you know, big, big ish, big ish. Um, Hyrule they Warriors. They're, yeah, they're, they're gonna make a Dynasty Warriors with Zelda. Which I, I watched that trailer. It was goofy. It was funny. I'm never gonna play that game. Could not care less about it. Uh, but fuck it you. Seems goofy. You're gonna review that game. Oh, Alex, you know that that would never happen to me. That would only happen to you. Don't <laughs> yeah, don't even front. That's not even. Come on. You are now our resident Zelda reviewer. I think you know you, you were the last person true. to do Zelda review. So That's I true. think that, that is that that is now your wheelhouse. And that also by default makes you our new Dynasty Warriors editor. So congratulations! Man, well, I have I, these three Dynasty Warrior games I need to review. One star. I've already reviewed them. Dynasty Warriors sucks. So. Okay. I don't care. I don't care for That's those cool. Games. You can just write that into the game space. That'd be fine. Yeah, I'll just pre-write those reviews. Like, just get them ready now. Like, one star, one star, one star. Cool. It's, and my the review text is just Dynasty Warriors. My Maybe own, Ze my own? Zelda yeah. will get two stars. Okay. Z Dynasty Warriors. Zelda, All right. Two stars. Okay. Yeah, that sounds that sounds about right. Uh, yeah, that's a weird. I mean, I guess that's a weird announcement. But at the same time, those games have the you know the Dynasty Warriors franchise has its niche. There are people that fucking love that series. There is at least one special guest top ten list that has Dynasty Warriors 8 on it. I will not say who it is. I will wow. just say someone really liked Dynasty Warriors 8 enough to put it on their list. So that is what it is. Uh, I will just say again, for the record, my favorite part of that trailer is when Link opens the giant chest, the big chest opening music happens, and then a shitty placeholder title screen pops yeah, up. That that's... is the best part. <laughs> that is so the best part. We yeah, threw great. this announcement together as hastily as humanly possible. Check this out. Oh God! All I can think of when I watch that, I'm not sure if you've seen uh, the Rome Total War mod that someone has made for Zelda. No. So I don't know Rome Total War Zelda. Yeah, High Rule Total War, which is all I can think about watching that trailer. Which is basically yeah, someone added Zelda characters and enemies to uh, Rome Total War, which sounds awesome. Like that just oh. sounds ridiculous. Like yeah, just search for like. Some images of that. It looks fucking nuts. They turned like the Majora's Mask, uh, mask into like this giant creature. That it's creepy. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. Um. So I don't know. Yeah. It's. I bet people like Dynasty Warriors will like this new one. Not for me. Um. I wish what for me was this Yoshi's New Island, but that game looks like garbage. I don't know if it looks like garbage, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to make of that exactly. Um. Is that was that the 3DS one they showed? Yeah, I mean, to be fan, to be fair, uh, 3DS games in general look really terrible because the resolution is really tiny, and then yeah. when blown up on a 1080p monitor for a trailer that's probably 720p, um, it's just it does all sorts of bad stuff to to game that has art assets and a resolution uh, that is just not conducive to looking good in the way that we view game trailers. Um, so I'm. 
hesitant on it, uh, but I don't think it looks very good. I I would really would have preferred, you know, a hand drawn sequel if they were going to make another sure. one. Um, but uh, you know, I benefit of the doubt. You know, I think Zelda did not look that great when I initially saw it either. I think that art works just fine in the world, even if it's a little bland. Um, yeah. But I don't. Yeah, I don't know. The game just looks kind of boring, and I hope it's good. But uh, watch this know. turn out to be the one Jeff really likes. Wouldn't right? That, just be that would be perfect, right? that would yeah. be that would be the ultimate. That would be the ultimate irony. That's not going to happen, though. Come on. No, of course not. Um, anything with Yoshi and Baby Mario is an automatic. Uh, not going to happen for him. Uh, other than that, it was just, you know, mostly trailers. For, uh, I guess there was NES Remix, which I've heard is actually kind of terrible. Um, that would be too bad. I, I think it's been far too long before Nintendo has jumped on the, hey, let's exploit our catalog in really weird ways. Um, yeah. Because ROM hackers have been doing that for a long time uh, with uh, fortuitous results, and it's it's nice that they're getting around to messing around with their games in weird ways, and you know, it may, hopefully this is just the first step in them doing weirder stuff, uh, but it would be cool to see them do more of this. Um, yeah, the spirit behind it is great. I love the idea of it. The problem is, and at least from what I've read, is one, they are really only taking from the selection of games they already have and the virtual console, and two, most of the challenges they have derived for those are kind of shitty. Um so, you know, I, I'll probably check it out at some point myself, but uh, looking at the list, it's like, oh, hey, golf for the NES. I have to get a hole-in-one. That that doesn't actually sound like very much fun because no. that game is is okay, but it's, like, it's kind of hard, and I don't think I really want to just do that as part of a game. Sure. Uh, I And if it's a lot of stuff like that, then I don't see a And, then, you know, for 20 but is it 15 or is it $20? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, Whatever probably it is. 15. Probably 15 Yeah. For 15 bucks, I don't know. I mean, that, that like if it doesn't have a great selection of games and the challenges aren't that interesting, then that's kind of a bummer. I would hope that... This is really the thing, is that the Virtual Console really needs to get blown out at some point. They really need to bring a lot more stuff to that thing, even if it's just the entirety not, of the Nintendo library. They're not going to do that. That's, but they need that's, to! Like, makes, a, that makes way too much sense. I, yeah, I, I know, but... But come on, man! I agree. I agree. Believe me, you give me that virtual console subscription service, I'm on board, baby. I'll pay for that shit. I'll happily pay for that shit. Seven ninety nine a month to get access to everything that Nintendo made for the NES and SNES. Charge me more to get access to the third party stuff. I'm there, baby. I'm all over it. Give me my. Give me my. That, if that is just all that Nintendo does to match, you know, a PlayStation Plus sort of thing is just a virtual console subscription. They get so much more money out of me because I'm tired. I'm done. I'm not buying virtual console games anymore. Like, Earthbound was it because that's like, you know, there are obvious reasons for that to be an exception to the rule. But I'm not buying Link to the Past again. I'm not buying Mario again. Like, I'll buy it as part of a bundle, as part of a, a service that Nintendo offers. But I am done. I am yeah. never buying a virtual console game again because I have no confidence it will transfer to another machine. I will just have to buy that game again. I could just. I'm done, and so yeah. I'm. But I'm much like they would get over a hundred dollars from me if they're charging, uh, you know, a premium for a subscription monthly. That I probably wouldn't even use that much every month. But you know yeah. what? I'd feel really good knowing that I could. Yeah. If I just want to play Super Metroid. Boom! I can just boot up and play Super Metroid. And there are all, yeah. Ugh. There are all these rumors now about the WWE doing its own network. They've been talking about doing this for years. And the latest thing that they are apparently talking about doing is a straight-up Netflix-style subscription service where you get access to their entire goddamn video library, which includes, like, WWF, WWE, WCW, ECW, all their TV shows, all their pay-per-views, all that shit. All of it. And they're talking about charging, like, I don't know, 15 bucks a month or something for it. That is genius, I don't yeah. know why more companies that have these great back catalogs of material don't do this kind of thing because it's totally feasible and it's not super crazy to enact, especially if you're just talking about Nintendo stuff that is wholly owned by them. I understand getting stuff from other publishers is probably more of a pain in the ass and maybe you have to swap that stuff out sometime, but they have a huge library of just their own stuff that they could easily offer people and they don't. And it's... Well, Thing. I'm sure. I'm sure the, the you know, you know the, the the reasoning must be you know you know short term versus long term, right? Like they you know when they make a big push for like putting out Super Metroid, 
You know, you get a lot of people up front paying a premium for that, and are they making more money on that in the short term with a lot of people paying a premium up front? Um, and then just they're not making wants to... any fucking money now on that thing. Well, I, I'm I'm agreeing with you, but I'm saying you know there, maybe there is a, justific a justification that they look at that it makes sense to get all that money at a premium from the people that will pay rather than you know how many more people they think they would possibly get. Uh, I I think at this point it makes no sense to launch this uh, service on the Wii U as much as I like it. You know, from a business perspective, I think. If they were to launch whatever they're going to launch next, which, you know, assuming will be some sort of uh, console handheld hybrid, if that machine launched as, like, get new Nintendo games and as bundled in as a subscription, get access to every game Nintendo's ever made, I think that is a compelling reason to buy a new hardware platform that Nintendo pushes versus an old hardware platform that as well as the Wii U could possibly do, even in the most... Uh, positive scenario you can think of, it's not going to carry the company forward. So does it make sense to waste something like that, which would be a huge move on the Wii U, on the 3DS? Or does it make sense to just exploit as they've done in the past, kind of hobble along with this stuff as they have in the past, and then launch that with a new console as a big new push? That probably makes more sense. It I'm does. not saying Nintendo is even smart enough to, to pull that off, because they have done such a poor job of exploiting the virtual console even in ways you can exploit people. And I use the yeah. term exploit because a lot of what Nintendo can do with nostalgia is exploit people's nostalgia, and they've done just a terrible job of that. So yeah. I would love to think that they're just being smart about the long term and saying our new hybrid console is going to have the subscription service at the start with Nintendo Network ID. You're going to get 30 days free when you buy it. And so you get access to all this Nintendo stuff, and then you're going to be like, oh, God, like, isn't it so cool that I have cloud saves that go on my handheld and my thing at home, and I can play my games wherever I want, and wouldn't that be such a wonderful scenario? And it's you never going to you, happen. You've, you've painted a wonderful picture here. Right. Unfortunately, it is a picture that I don't think Nintendo is ever going to paint for themselves. Fuck, but how cool would that be? It was a great idea. It's a fucking fantastic idea, God. and it's so fantastic that no one at Nintendo would ever think that is a good idea. I want to be wrong about this. I would love it if they just came out with something that actually, you know, either justified the purchase of the Wii U by doing this catalog thing, or, like you said, wipe the slate clean, new hardware thing, fine. I don't even hate the Wii U. I've, I've kind of grown no, to like it over the course I of do. the year. I think it's a neat little piece of hardware. It is just so poorly managed and so apparently useless to third-party publishers because nobody cares about it. Nobody wants it, and that is so fucking tragic. It is tragic what has happened with that thing. Yeah, so, well, we'll see what happens. Uh, it won't happen, but it one, won't. one can hope. One can hope. Or, like, even imagine if it was, like, the subscription subsidized that console. If yeah. you agreed to a year of Nintendo, and then you could just buy the machine for 100 bucks. Like, ah. Uh, I would totally anyway. buy a year of Nintendo. I would do it. Anyway. Your walk is coming to Steam. That's cool. Maybe that I'll actually cool. play that now. Yeah, your walk is great. Uh, they're adding a map. Uh, which is something that uh, that game could have used. I drew a map, and drawing a map was cool, but I know that not everyone likes to do that. I hate drawing um, things, so yes. Stanley Parable is coming to Mac. That's cool, cool I guess. That game's great. You should play that, that game. That game's great. Um, Steam adds VR support. So Good. Oculus Rift games are easy to find. Um, that Future seems smart, too. I don't have any comments on that, other than that no. being... Really smart. Uh, I like this question in the chat. Arbut, Arbuth not. Uh, ETA on Star Trek Dynasty Warriors. Gan Ning vs. Worf. That sounds... I don't care about Star Trek, and that sounds awesome. Yeah. I don't know if there's enough enemies you could really throw at anyone to, to make that make sense. Maybe it was the Borg. If it was just like just endless Borg coming at you, that would probably that's probably the only villain I can think of that you could actually do that with. Can't really yeah. do the Yellow Turban Rebellion with that one, unfortunately. Uh, do we want to talk about the one thing? Right. Yeah. Right. We did. We did talk about that. Yeah. Um. So PAX, uh, starting with PAX East and extending to uh, PAX Prime and uh, assumingly PAX Australia, is rolling out what they are calling diversity lounges, uh, right. which is a uh, place that will be uh, in a highly trafficked area. Um, that they, at least that's kind of how they're, what they're calling it, 
uh, that will sort of have its own panel track and will also... Uh, but the idea is like they are trying to respond to some of the criticisms that uh, PAX has become sort of an unsafe place for uh, certain groups, um, and this is their way of trying to address that. They've partnered with uh, one of the co-founders of GamerX, G-A-Y-M-E-R-X, uh, which was a, by all accounts, a very successful um, a sort of tiny convention gathering in San Francisco uh, to try and organize this. Uh, these changes were uh, leaked on, I believe, the website Indie Static. Um, they were uh, sort of just a series of like PDFs um, explaining some of these changes, and uh, people kind of jumped to the worst possible conclusions. I think rightly Myself so. Included. Um, based on uh, PAX's previous history with dealing with sensitive topics like this. Uh, not to mention that uh, the term uh, diversity lounge um, immediately just makes you think of some sort of um, weird diversity ghetto uh, for those other people uh, to go to. And the idea that uh, it would suggest that the rest of PAX is not a safe place uh, for diversity and that uh, people of diversity or however you would get into a weird classification issue uh, should just go to that area and not worry about the rest of PAX. Uh, right. Now, you know, since then, uh, Robert Koo has come out to uh, explain a little bit further about their thought process behind that, um, and, you know, that's not the idea. Um, and, you know, I, I I find it hard to continue to give uh, Penny Arcade the benefit of the doubt, but, you know, partnering with someone like GamerX, I think, is a, a smart decision, and, you know, talking to folks that are all about inclusivity uh, seems to be the right kind of people to talk to. Um, obviously, you know, talking the talk is much different than walking the walk on this stuff. And, you know, continues your tradition of PAX just having to, you know, being backed into a corner and explaining itself very poorly. Yeah. Um, there are a million other ways to imagine how something like this was rolled out and explained um, because they really do need to uh, get over... <laughs> people don't give them the benefit of the doubt anymore. And if they wanted to explain this in a fashion that contextualize it in the way that you know they clearly want it to be, um, they didn't do that. And, and so obviously this is starting already off on, on the wrong foot, um, but it's hard to uh, blame PAX for that when, you know, this is their own thing. This is something they could have handled uh, better if they wanted to. Yeah, I mean, reading the explanation that, that, that Koo put out and kind of getting the better sense of what they're trying to do, I still... I have my reservations about it, but, you know, I'll admit that I immediately jumped to probably the worst conclusion possible, which was that, you know, we're just going to go put all the people who are complaining over here while the rest of you go have fun over here. It doesn't really sound like that's what they're trying to do. If anything, they're trying to, to do the best they can, I guess, to, to, to kind of reach out to people who have felt slighted and, you know, marginalized by the, the, the core PAX audience and, and, frankly, the people who put the show on. Uh, and, you know, it does feel like they are, at the very least, trying to take a first step here. I think that people were not necessarily incorrect to assume that this was going to go very poorly and that this was not, you know, uh, really in the best interest of anybody. But I don't know. I mean, it's like, at this point, give it a shot. You know, anything is better than just continuing on down the current path that they've been on um, of just sort of, you know saying, hey, we, we have listened to your concerns and then going up on stage and then basically, you know, blithely dismissing everyone's concerns whenever they get the opportunity. Um, if this is, you know, an actual positive first step in the direction of, you know, kind of trying to make PAX a more inclusive, more, you know, safe feeling place, then good. Um, it deserves to at least be tried. If it goes badly, then that feedback should be taken and, you know, they should look at how to readdress it as the show goes on. And really what they need to do is they need to find a way to just kind of communicate to their core audience, look, this kind of shit is not okay anywhere. You just kind of need to be cool to people while you're at this show regardless. And they just need to be much more harsh about people who don't, you know, who make other people feel like shit when they're at PAX. Um, yeah, and, I think, and, and I think the, the problem, you know, with, with this is that, um, you know, for me, is that a lot of my, you know, my issues as... You know, someone that you know doesn't feel uncomfortable with PAX because I am not I am not who this is is meant to to make right. <laughs> feel more safe um, or included at, at something like PAX uh, as as a as a, a straight white dude. But uh, you know, it needs it needs to come from the guys that are have been causing, or you know, very specifically yeah. one person at Penny Arcade um, that has been causing all the problems. And so it's yeah. it's it's less to me about there being a diversity lounge as much as there being. Um, an acknowledgement within the leadership and organization of Penny Arcade 
uh, acknowledging what is the actual problematic thing, which right. is I feel like has less to do with the space and more to do with the people that are making the space uncomfortable as a result. Um, and that does not get addressed here, um, at least in a meaningful capacity. And they don't deserve the benefit of the doubt at this point because they haven't earned yeah. it. Like they, they need to earn the right uh, to have that back. And and I suppose this is a step in that direction. Um, and I, although this is a serious subject, I can't help but keep laughing at people in the chat who keep bringing up the Anchorman quote of diversity being an old wooden ship because that's immediately what I started thinking of yeah. when the diversity lounges were <laughs> were disclosed especially with Anchorman 2 coming out this weekend. Hopefully that movie isn't shitty. Um, yeah, so, you know, we'll see. Uh, we'll definitely have to see what, what happens with this. Um, you know, hard to have too many more thoughts about it without seeing, you know, maybe what else they have to say or how this rolls out in practice. Um, I want to keep my fingers crossed, but I got to say I don't have a whole lot of reason to be uh, positive other than yeah. the fact that they seem to have partnered themselves with people that, you know, maybe could pull it off. Yeah, it's, you know, I'm at this point now where it's like, if, if they had continued to do nothing, then that would be worse than at least them ham-fistedly trying to do something. And so, I don't know. I mean, it's like, let's see what they do at PAX East. If it turns out to be kind of a shit show, well, then, you know, we can readdress it then. If it turns out to actually be a step towards something better at that show, then good, I guess. But, you know, yeah. it's, it, this by itself, I don't think is going to fix the primary issue at hand, which I think we, we, we know what that is. So We will see. PAX East is not convention season. Not, not that yet. far away. <laughs> yeah, it's, what, March? Yeah, at least PAX and uh, GDC are a little separated this year. So, whew. Whew. Uh, yeah. Graham Nix has a question for you, Alex. Uh -huh. Are you going to do a movie podcast any time soon? Probably not until early next year. Uh, Rory and I had tried to do one a couple weeks ago. And it uh, something got fucked up like halfway through the recording and it got garbled, so we tried oh, to get, get it again. But then uh, Rory got I don't know consumption or something. I don't really he know is. what what he caught, but he's been super sick for like weeks now. Um, yeah, he's, he's been a bad way for a I while. He's better now. now, but he was pretty sick for a while. So uh, he has not been in the office. We have not been able to actually do anything for a while. Uh, we will revisit that early next year. Okay. Um. Did you see, well, because people are asking, mm -hmm. there's no movie podcast. Did you see The New Hobbit? What did you think of it? I'm not going to see The New Hobbit. No? The first one was so goddamn boring okay. that I, even if they have marginally improved it in the second one, it's not enough. I just don't care enough about the story of The Hobbit to want to see that. I don't. I will only go see The New Hobbit if my wife remembers that it's out. And says we should go see it, and I'm like, okay, like I'll, you know, I'll go see it, but I'm not, yeah. I'm not going to be the one suggesting we go see it, but I will, I'll watch that on Blu-ray, and then I'll go see the last one in the theater. I feel like yeah. that because I, I am now just super genuinely curious in maybe a train wreck fashion to see, because it, it sounds like from what I've read, the second one basically kind of ends more or less where The Hobbit ends, which means the third book or movie is like all made up new material, you know, appendices stuff to link it back to Lord of the Rings, which that just sounds like a really great way to enrage a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Which means I want to be there in the theater to see it firsthand. Uh, so I'll probably see the third one in the theater, but I, I yeah, I'm with you. The, the first one, yeah, they, they got as greedy as you can get in terms of exploiting a franchise um, in, a, in a really bummer a bummer fashion. And Peter Jackson, he's just not that good enough. They... It just, it doesn't feel like he really cares that much. Like, you know, in the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, you know, even where it dragged, there was a certain enthusiasm in the filmmaking there and a certain necessity because they weren't trying to, you know, spread one book into three movies. They were trying to spread three books into three movies and they had to sit, they actually had to, you know, condense a lot of stuff to make it work. With with the Hobbit, it doesn't feel like he wants this to be three movies. Like it, every every in that first movie, God, like every scene felt like it went on five minutes too long, and that what was happening in those extra five minutes was just nonsense. Like nothing was happening of interest at all. I I guess this one is a little bit more lively, and it has a little bit more going on story wise. And you know, hey, Legolas is back! Yay, he's 
He's a good looking man. And Evangeline Lilly, you love her. She yeah, was on came Lost. Yeah, came, came from Lost is in it. And people are, people, she's people suddenly are, doing stuff again. People are telling me that it doesn't. Maybe I maybe I read the wrong things. People are saying it only ends about three fifths through The Hobbit, which is a fucking joke. Isn't it like a two hundred page book? Like yeah, total? like it's a really lovely simple story. And I don't have any problems with Peter Jackson's desire to connect it to Lord of the Rings because Tolkien, historically, if you go back and read, like he was upset that he didn't put in more connections and he wanted to. There's actually like a story about how he wanted to go and rewrite The Hobbit. Um, and and put in more explicit connections to Lord of the Rings so that it made more he- more sense and that it didn't feel as retconny. So he just wanted to go right. to retcon it the whole way, and he didn't end up doing that. Um, and the appendices are, are what like kind of like help that make a more of a cohesive whole. But and so I don't have a problem with the connection stuff. And I'm not even that much of a like a Tolkien guy. Like I, I like Lord of the Rings, but it's not yeah. like beloved to me. Um, the Dark Tower is probably my epic thing that I would get you know antsy about. Um, but I don't. It's yeah. It just feels so exploitative and so boring and just. Jesus, I, I can't. Ugh. It just gets it gets me angry even thinking about it. And I don't even care that much about Tolkien. Yeah, I just I, the whole thing feels like a really intense cash grab. You know, and I I wish if they had just made it two movies, I probably would have been okay with that. You know, again, The Hobbit is nowhere near my favorite story, but I could see that being done well on the screen if they had just pared it down to the more essential elements. It is just, there is a lot of inessential bullshit in that first movie, and so much, in fact, that I just, I can't bring myself to go see the second one. I just don't care. There are at least a half dozen other movies in theaters right now I would rather go see. Yeah, I haven't, I still haven't seen, I kind of want to see 12 Years a Slave, because that seems like that's going to be like the runaway Oscar movie. Yeah, it's going to be up there. Um, still haven't seen Thor, so I still want to see that. And I have to go see Anchorman 2, because Anchorman is pro- might be my favorite comedy of all time. It's certainly I, I, up there. There are a lot of people who have said to me it is not as good as the first, but it is still very enjoyable, and there are at least a few people who have told me it is a total abomination. I don't know who to believe. I am just, at some point, I'm going to wander into a theater and just let it happen to me, and I'll see where it goes. You know, I I, I don't have any expectations, really, for that's, it. That's such a weird movie to be a sequel to, given that, like, the movie didn't do that well when it came out, and yeah. people like Steve Carell weren't a big deal when that movie came out. And also, I saw that movie and enjoyed it, but that was a movie that only became a classic for me upon, like, the 30th viewing. Like, it was right. just... It's a movie of pure jokes. Like, the story yeah. is nonsense. Like, it's, you know... There is one, but it's always just about, like, Ron Burgundy having, you know... He's enlightened now, but it's all just BS. It's really just literally a bunch of comedians sitting around cracking jokes. I love the idea that I saw Adam McKay talking about how if the movie does well enough, and it sounds like you know it's probably going to do pretty well at the box office, that they want to do um, a second set of special screenings where they have enough material where they could replace, they could have the same exact story and replace every single joke in the movie. Okay. And that you could go at midnight sure. and see a special screening of the movie where it's the same friggin' movie, but every single joke is replaced with a different joke, which just... Even if those jokes are total crap, I, that is amazing. Like yeah. I would pay to see that just because that's so incredible that they have that much material. Um, and, and I like a lot of those comedians so much that I would love to I would love to see that. I'm just looking at the list here of what I still need to see. I need to see 12 Years a Slave. I need to see Inside Lewin Davis. Yeah. I need I'll to see Nebraska. Him. What's Nebraska? That's the new Alexander Payne movie. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I need to see Her which right. is the new Spike Jones, which I've heard right. is great. Uh, I still need to see... There's a new movie with Steve Coogan and uh, Judy Dench that looks very funny that I would like to see, uh, despite the fact that it looks like the kind of thing my mom would go see. Uh, okay. And, yeah, I guess Anchorman too. And I think that's kind of the... the, the cur- and that could not be more different from all the other things I just listed, but uh, no. I think that's that's kind of what I got on my list before I, I, I fly off to China here at the end of the month. So we'll... Uh, We'll see how many of those I manage to get in. I would like to get at least a couple of those in. Are you doing any research before you go to China, or are you trying to go in like completely? I'm gonna this just. This is this is it, pretty much. I have this Lonely Planet book. I'm gonna look through it. Uh, <laughs> are, so you my girlfriend... to... are you trying to learn how to say hello? No. No. Okay. All right. You're just no. gonna be white man in China, and you're just gonna just roll with it. No, because I have a, I have a translator. Yeah, you're uh, right. That's right. That's right. 
so my girlfriend was born in Shanghai, moved to the States when she was like four or five years old. Um, she has been back several times. And, you know, I mean, that city apparently changes so rapidly, like landscape wise, that it's hard to, you know, uh, know what's still there and what isn't. But she hasn't been there in about seven years. Uh, so it's probably going to be a pretty different experience. But she at least knows the basic lay of the land. So I'm just going to kind of follow her around. We're going to figure some things out to do and to see while we're there. Uh, it's going to be an interesting eight days. I, you know, I've, I've been to Hong Kong before, but I've never been to mainland China, and that's I, I, I'm expecting a fairly different experience. So, Why did, did we'll you go to Hong Kong for like a vacation thing? That's where, yeah, her parents live there now. Oh, um, ne- I've never been. I have never been to Asia outside of outside of Japan for the the one time I went for TGS. So the hilarious tragedy of all this is that I've never been to Japan, and my so my first time landing on Japan soil will be for a two hour layover before I oh, fly to Shanghai. Oh, you're going to Narita. Yeah. <laughs> so, hi Japan, bye Japan. That's pretty much all I'm getting out of that. Oh, that's too bad. That's yeah. too bad. But Shanghai will be cool. That'll be fun. I'll need to wear a gas mask, it sounds like, but that'll be fine. Uh, let's see. People say, asking, you think the Vita will have a better year in 2014? Uh, hard to say. I to find I, better. I, yeah, I, I don't know if it will... I mean, but yes, it will have a better year in 2014, because a lot of what um, Sony has lined up for that machine are cross-buy, independent-made games that are coming to PS4 and Vita. There have been some of those on PS3, but a lot of the ones they're lining up, whether you're talking about like Nuclear Throne uh, and games of that nature, like a lot of those are coming out next year. So, you know, will the Vita have a sales renaissance in 2014? Probably not. Yeah. Uh, but will it have a strong reason to own, if you own a PlayStation 4 and have PlayStation Plus, like, absolutely. Uh, I think between remote play and the games that will be cross-buy compatible, uh, you're going to have a strong reason to, to want to have that machine um, if you're in that ecosystem. But, you know, I I think even, in, you know, Sony has, you know, if you listen to the tone of their interviews, the way they talk about that machine, they have more or less accepted the fact that it is basically becoming an expensive accessory. Um, so... I still think it would be a really cool idea if they turned that into just a remote play machine and tore out the guts of that and, and sold it for cheaper. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if they'll actually do something like that, um, but I, I, I think that the Vita will become increasingly, uh, sort of by accident, the best accessory that Sony has ever made as a company that largely has done a poor job supporting accessories, um, but sort of by necessity to make the Vita um, interesting. Uh, they've they, they've kind of turned into this, and I think it will end up being a really strong uh, addition. You know, essentially, you know, if you can find the Vita for a decent price, like it's not that much more expensive than when you're paying for an Xbox uh, with Connect. Uh, if you chose to get a PS4, um, so just kind of think of the Vita as the Connect of the PlayStation, which is that's not a, a great comparison. That makes that sound worse than it is. Yeah. Uh, but if you think about it in terms of an accessory that is. You know, sort of value enhancing the the box you already have. You know, I th- I think that works really well. It's unfortunate. I mean, that's not a it's not a bad thing if that's what it ends up becoming. You know, primarily a, a streaming device for the PS4 and just a host for a ton of PlayStation Network indie games. Because I mean, I've I've ended up playing a lot of that stuff on my Vita this year. That's kind of what I've used it for primarily. I just wish that there were enough fully developed Vita games to really support that as, you know, a meaningful handheld system on its own merit still. Because I'm looking back on this year, the number of actual straight-up Vita games, just games released, like, in these stupid, you know, little tiny blue boxes, there's, like, maybe a dozen of them total. Which is always pretty good, though. Terraway's Terraway's great! Rayman on the Vita was pretty great, you know? Like, there were were good games on there. There were a few, but there were only a few. And Mm. it doesn't seem like that's going to change. So, I, you know... Yeah, I guess if, if that system is going to survive, it probably has to be rebranded and re sort of just, you know, rejiggered into something that is meaningful to people that own other PlayStation systems. I wish it didn't have to be on those terms because I think it could be a totally great platform if the games were there that, you know, supported it, but they're not. And they haven't been since that thing came out. It's it's been the PlayStation Network that has kept that thing alive. It has not been other publishers coming in and trying to make games specifically for the Vita, which is a bummer. Sure. Um, all right. Well, as we wrap this out, what are you uh, what are you looking forward to next year? You got any? Do you have a game on your list that really scratching an itch you want to scratch next year in 2014? 
first and foremost, I'm looking forward to it being a different year than this one for the yeah, last year. This, God. Yeah, this year's been kind of shitty. Yeah, um, um, goodbye, not for goodbye. games, but for everything else. Yeah, but for life. Like yeah. I, moved, I moved to Chicago, but for all sorts of other reasons. Yeah, 2013. Bad life here. Yeah, Get eat out. a dick. Move on. Straight up. Um, that said, there are certainly several games. I mean, Titanfall is one that everyone is, you know, rightfully excited for. I certainly am as well. Uh, I am excited to finally see what South that South Park game is. I have trepidation about it now because of all the weird shit it's gone through, but I'm still looking forward to playing it. I'm really that is probably that is the game I am most excited slash curious about in yep. 2014. I that game I think will either be total garbage mm-hmm. or really amazing. Also, Witcher Three. Gonna say yeah. yeah. I I want I, after after seeing that E3 demo, that one has been near the top of my list pretty much the whole way through. I am very looking forward to that one. So, Man, and I I I loved the hell out of Witcher Two. Um, I played that on 360, and that is still if no one if you have not played that game before. The 360 port is is excellent. Um, it's really really well done. Uh, I had a lot of fun with it, um, and yeah, it made me super excited for Witcher 3, which was not a franchise that was even on my radar. Um, and now I am, you know, that's that's easily in my top five most anticipated games of the year. Totally. What else you got? What what else are you looking forward to next year? I, I love Miami too. Yeah, sure, totally. Octodad. Someone just said Octodad in the chat. Yeah, yeah that's coming yep. out next year. The Witness. I can't wait to play that. Ready, ready for the witness? I've I played like a third of the witness, and according to Jonathan Blow, last I talked to him, like the puzzles were basically final when I played that game with Ryan, like basically like almost two years ago at this point. I think he just and, keeps adding stuff to it. Well, what he's adding are is the world elements. Right. You know? The story stuff was very bare bones uh, when we when we played it, and he kind of told us to not pay attention to it, and the uh, the world was extremely bare, um, and all that stuff has been fleshed out. But by all accounts, a lot of the puzzles that, if I somehow remember any of the solutions, are the same solutions to those puzzles. Those that stuff had kind of been finalized, and everything else is what he was spending his time and money on uh, figuring out. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, uh, I'm curious to play that. A lot of people pointing out uh, Persona Five. Is that next year? That's next uh, year. Is that 2015? I think it is. Persona Five. 2014. Also, he specifically said on Twitter apparently recently that he actually was adding more real puzzles to that game on okay. top of everything else. So he is just he is just continually adding things to it. Persona 5, yeah, is winter 2014. I don't think that means it comes out here. Yeah, year, that could but... be that could be like January or February of 2015 at this point. So yeah, um, that will be a Sega joint. Ooh. Ooh. You know, they haven't given us reason to be alarmed yet, so let's just hope that they're just going to let those guys do their thing and not try and, you know, fucking rub Sonic all over that shit or something. You know, like, I don't, I don't want that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually going to try and... Uh, my, my agenda for before the games start really hitting in, in March is to try and, uh, try and... I'm going to try and play Persona 4, or at least get deep into it, and then I'm also going to try and play Dark Souls. So I want to try and play Dark Souls before Dark Souls 2 comes out. So that's kind of my plan. I'm going to not do that. Okay. Yeah. I'm just, gonna, I'm, I'm just staying away from the whole Dark Souls thing. Not for me. So I will let all everyone else enjoy it while I'm over here playing my stupid wrestling games or whatever. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. Um, and with that, I think we're going to close out 2013. That's a year. That, is, that has been a year. That has been seven months, not quite a year. Mom and Nam was Coops and the Wolf. Um, it's been a good seven months, though. Yeah, we're not we're not sure when we'll be back. Uh, you're going to China, and then you're kind of taking some time off when you come back from China. So we're gonna kind of play by year. At the um, latest, let's say mid January. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we're out of guess. I need to go wrangle a whole new set of guests. Uh, people have uh, folks they would like to see on the show. Uh, feel free to shoot me a, a PM and. I will see what I can do. Uh, I've got some ideas. i got some uh, some folks in mind that I'd like to, to line up. But, you know, I think we're going to try and continue uh, the trend of, of having uh, guests on the Monday show. I think it's been a lot of fun and, and definitely made the show more interesting. Um, so we'll, we'll try and keep that rolling as much as we can. But, uh, Alex, it's been a pleasure. And uh, I, will, uh, I will see you in 2014. Likewise, sir. Looking forward to it. And, you know, ow! Exactly. <laughs>